Hooked up? Yep. This week on Kentucky Field. Oh, a little bigger fish. We're after one of the hardest fighting and most overlooked fish that swims in Kentucky's waterways, <laughs> the carp. Well, that was a lot of fun. Next, we're floating one of the state's beautiful streams and catching fish along the way. There he is. Got him now? I think so. <laughs> then, we visit biologists in Western Kentucky to find out how they're increasing fish numbers. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! My first musk. <laughs> Mercy Leo! Yeah, we're here to get Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Many anglers enjoy fishing for carp worldwide, and they are a very hard fighting species. But for whatever reason here in the United States, we continue to miss out on this great opportunity. This right here is a pack bait. I make it out of breadcrumbs, strawberry jello. I got some flour. I have a couple of eggs in there, a can of sweet corn, and a can of hominy for a little bit of extra flavor but it usually packs together pretty good. Make it into a dough ball, and I'll put it on my method lead, and it'll act as a chum, and it'll stick on there pretty good. They have different rigs set up for it, but I use a slip sinker. That way uh, he, he's, he can pull or he can do what he needs to do before he fills the hook. This is strictly a chumming method right here. Yes, this sir. is a way to try to draw the fish in, and then they're gonna hit this, which is little rubber pieces of fake corn. Yes, sir. And a little bitty hook. Yes, they'll inhale the hook and if fall goes well, they won't feel the hook at all. Most of the time, it'll catch them right in the lip mm. when they inhale it. <laughs> so now you've got this rod holder set up. It's a two-piece style rod holder. And then this thing here is actually battery powered. Yes. And you have run your line down in there and you've got this set where your drag is almost completely open. He pulls the line, it feeds through, gets tight, catches right here, then it has to go up and over a roller, okay. which will set off your alarm. Set off your alarm, so it lets you know exactly when you're getting a bite. Yes. So today we're here in Hodgenville, and I am learning about something completely new to me, and that is carp fishing. I've been fishing my entire life, and today I have seen more gear and more equipment dedicated to carp fishing than I ever thought was even possible. All this stuff to me is a complete new world, and it's a world that I have a lot of interest in because, you know, I fish around the state of Kentucky, I always see carp. It's one of those things that I think that carp are in almost every single body of water. Today, let's hope we catch a fish or two, and I've already learned a ton on how to target and catch carp. Uh-oh. Here we go. Is it hooked up? Yep. All right. You know, there's something so cool about targeting a specific fish and catching the fish you're targeting. Coming back out now. Got up on the bank, now it's running back out deep. Look at that thing. Oh. Did it come off right there? Hey, well, you know what? That's encouraging. We had a fish this close to the bank. That was probably my error. Well, it happens. It does. Take a couple pieces of corn, just pop your holes. I call it stacking the corn up. And you can see it better without the corn on there itself. I got a long hair. It kind of loops out like that off your knotless knot. Oh, I got you, okay. And then you take it and slide them on. Slide them on, it hooks. Then they got these fancy little bait stops. That just keeps your corn from flying off, huh? I'm supposed to keep the fish from stealing it too, but <laughs> apparently he was uh, wanting more than me. Uh-oh. That's a screamer. Hooked up? Yep. 
I'd say this one's a carp because he's just purely running. Okay. Man, they are getting right up here on the bank. Look at that. Look how fast that fish is. A lot of people consider carp trash fish. You don't think of them as being real athletic. Pretty athletic fish, aren't they? They're relentless. Oh, there we go. We got it in there now. This is, it looks like just a regular common carp. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So you said you have caught mirrored carp out of here. Yes. Explain to me what a mirrored carp looks like. Uh, they'll have bigger scales and a wider pattern. They're more colorful fish. Okay. Well, this is probably what, about a four or five pound fish, yes. something, like, something like that? There you go. It is a pretty fish. An extremely hard fighter. Oh, yeah. For anyone wanting to catch a fish that will pull your line, scream it, put it to its limits, there's nothing out there better than a carp. And like I said, they're just so, so plentiful. Yeah. Oh, man. That fish was released very healthy. Hopefully, one of these days it's on the end of your rod again. <laughs> Hopefully I can see him when he hits 20, 25 pounds. There you go. <laughs> that thing just keeps on going. How many days a week do you fish for carp? I, I, the only thing I don't fish in is the lightning. Yeah. I got a little waterproof canopy I set up. Uh-oh. Hooked up? Yep. There you go. Oh, a little bigger fish. Oh, is it catfish? No, a little bigger carp. This one's a, about three times the size of the last one, I believe. <laughs> am, I, am I going about this different than you normally would? Oh, Just a little bit, go. but hey, sorry. It works. <laughs> well, there you go. So again, it's another common carp. Yep. Man, that thing put up a good fight, huh? Yes, he did. And he's still got a lot of energy left in reserve. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what. I know now why when that thing went beep, beep, and stop, you didn't get all excited. Because when they decide to eat, they usually just go. Go. There was no playing around, it's just gone. This table you've got this fish in, this is strictly for what you're doing right now. It's for actually putting the fish in. And handling them. And handling the fish so you don't hurt them. Yep. Uh, a lot of people will get the hook out before you get them out of the water. Yeah. I bring them over here, that way if he does flop around, he's not thrashing on the bank. You can see what they're doing. They're just kind of sucking and, and picking up whatever's on the bottom. Bugs. Bugs. Worms. Uh, mussels. And they do have really, really, really soft lips. Yep. I Easy mean, to tear. extremely soft lips. I'm going to go ahead and get this one back in the water. So, you know, you, people talk about bass fishermen. They may say, hey, if I ever get a chance, you know, I want to go to St. Clair, smallmouth fish. Or if you're a largemouth fisherman, it might be Okeechobee. Where is your destination location anywhere in the world to go do what you're doing right here? I'd go back to Dale Hollow easily. That's the crazy thing. So people worldwide that start thinking about their destination location, any place to go to carp fish, it could be right here in Kentucky. Yeah, and, and the group I'm in, the carp group, that's the number one destination spot. Everyone says, I wanna to go to Dale Hollow. I'm going to Dale Hollow. I'm planning a trip to Dale Hollow. What do I need? What do I do? You know, that is the spot. Down there, it's it's not uncommon to catch 30, 40, 50 pound carp. Uh-oh, yep. it's got the bait runner, you flip it down. All right. Coming toward us. Man, I'll tell you one thing, carp are fast. Something so sluggish when you look at them in video can have that energy to just burst out of the pocket like a hole shot in a bass tournament. When I see a carp, they're usually sitting there, one spot, but when you get them hooked, man, they go. They do. Remind me of a striper taking off. Oh my gosh, they're much faster than I thought. This is kind of blowing me away. I'm just letting that rod just keep tension enough to keep it buried. <laughs> you know, when you start thinking about carp fishing, and I will tell you this is the first time I've ever targeted carp, but I'll tell you, you don't think about the skill that's gonna be required to land a fish this strong on such a little hook. This is, uh, this is something that takes a lot of technique and quite a bit of fishing skill. I believe he's in there. 
and uh, that's easily the biggest one of the day. I'll tell you what, nice job, Chad, nice uh, job. Oh, thank you. I will tell you this, this is, this is uh, definitely the very, very, very first time I've caught a carp while targeting carp. Now look at the size of the tail. Now this is where fish get their strength. Of course, they gotta have the, the mass here to be able to whip that tail, but look how much water that tail can push. Quite a bit, very powerful fish. It is, what a pretty fish. Look at the belly on them. I'll tell you, well that was a lot of fun. Let's get her back in, what do you think? Absolutely. There you go. Feel like a good fish? He feels like a nice one. Probably not as monstrous as yours. Well, that's just complete pure luck. I'll tell you what, if you ever thought, you know what, there's nothing biting in the middle of summer, hard to fish right now, and you got a pond and you know has some carp, get you a couple of these little hooks, get you the longest spinning rod you have around, and give this a try, because I'll tell you, this will test you, because it does take a certain level of skill to be able to bring in a fish this powerful with a very, very, very small hook and such a soft mouth. Here again with Lieutenant McQuarrie. How are you doing today? Great. Good to see you once again, Chad. You know, something that's gotten really popular for this time of year is jug fishing or noodle fishing. Now, noodle fishing is what? Basically, you're either using a jug or a swim noodle that you've cut into small sections and you're tying a line to it with a hook on the end and placing baits so you can hope to catch a fish. Now, there's some things that you have to make sure and look out for when you're doing this, and that is you have to make sure that the body of water you're on is legal to do this, right? Absolutely, make sure you check regulations before you go fishing and that the lake you're actually going to allows you to jug fish. And secondly, there's a limit per boat, correct? Correct, sometimes it's confused that it's 50 per person, but it's actually 50 jugs or noodles per boat. And this year there is also a change. You've always had to put information on there, but this year the information that you have to make sure is on that jug, attached to the jug or the line, is what? It's your customer ID number that can be found at the very top of your 2019 license. And make sure when you put that number on your noodle or jug, you place it in a way that it will not wear off easy. And anything else you need to think about when considering jug or noodle fishing? Keep up with the number of jugs or noodles that you put out and make sure that you're checking them every 24 hours. Okay, and that's good for the fish safety as well. And also, they can look pretty ratty out there on a the lake. We wanna make sure they're getting picked up and removed from the waterway. You're exactly right, Chad. Well, good luck in noodle and jug fishing. It's a lot of fun and it can be extremely productive. Absolutely. Are you an angler that's looking for additional access to more water? Well, kayak fishing might be just the thing for you. Spencer Parker, how you doing today? Great, Chad, pleasure to meet you. I tell you what, this time of year when it's too hot to sit in a bass boat, Catching fish and moving water is the place to go. It's really blown up the past few years, absolutely, and the kayak selection is amazing now. I mean, you can go from $200 kayak up to $4,000 or $5,000 kayak. It's a blast, it really is. So do you guys have people that will assist strictly fishermen now? If a person comes out and says, hey, I'd like to take a float, and I really want to focus on fishing, you guys have people that can help them out with that? Absolutely. I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm just a just an average Joe. I'm not a professional fisherman. Mm -hmm. I have a passion for fishing and I have a passion for kayaks that I love talking to people about kayaking and fishing. Well, you live in a good part of the state to have a passion for fishing and kayaking because I tell you, the Elkhorn Creek, it is legendary for fishing. You can't hardly beat a smallmouth, especially in moving water. There he is. Got him now? I think so. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's not a bad fish. No. Oh, they're so much fun. Here we go. Uh oh. <laughs> Not a very big fish. That thing came out of the water three feet. Yeah, and he was stripping drag too, wasn't he? Boy, I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> it sure didn't take that little uh, tiny brush hog long. There you go. Oh! He wanted it too, because when he hit it. it, he took off and gave me an aerial show. Did you see that? <laughs> awesome. There you go, baby. Thank you. Guarantee you, he's got a belly full of crawfish. Uh-huh. I think it was the second cast in there, and he just popped it. Put on a show. You know, this looks like a really good spot. We've got moving water and it's deep enough to hold a fish. We ought to be able to catch a fish here. Oh, here we go. 
a little bit smaller fish, but he wanted that one of the jig. They got some fight to them, don't they? Boy, don't they? <laughs> Tell you what, it's super fun catching these jokers. Whoop! He wanted back in. Don't eat my smallmouth. Get out of here. You know, Spencer, this is a little bit unique. Anytime that you're fishing on a creek in the state of Kentucky, if you're standing on the bottom, you're on somebody's property, you're trespassing. But Franklin County have actually passed some legislation that allows you to fish this, right? Yeah, as long as you gain access with permission or by public means, then yeah, you can wade anywhere in the water. Here we go. Oh yeah, got a jumper. Nice little 13 inch smallie. There he is. You know, targeting these areas right before you get into these riffles and right on the outside of the riffles. Man, if you're gonna only fish certain spots on a four mile run, that's where you that's want to That's where look. you want to be, yes sir. Nice little pretty smallmouth. Look how big and wide these tails are on these fish. For a fish that size, that's where the power comes, right there. Very healthy, very strong. Beautiful smallie. Got him. I got one too, little guy. <laughs> You know, when you get to a spot like this, what makes these spots so good is the reason those fish are sitting here. That's because they're feeding. And that's where the bait is getting pulled. There's fish out here all over, but the fish that are really wanting to eat and make it easy, they're sitting right there. Congregating right there in that spot. They know where to go. <laughs> in these rapids again, we've only caught like one or two fish today that were not right in the current. There he is. Felt like he's a little better, but I can't tell in this current. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a red eye. Nope. Nope. Small mouth. Oh, quick release. I always put a smile on my face. <laughs> Every time. No matter if they're big or little. Now, if they get real big, the smiles get a little bigger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they're always fun. Yeah. Had a friend of mine went to church with when I was about 12 years old. And uh, he invited me to go out to the game farm. I remember picking up a cheap little, gosh, it wasn't even a Zebco, like one of them little Shakespeare, whatever, and going out to the game farm with him. And uh, all it took was that first fish, uh, first fish, and I was hooked. No pun intended. Thirty years later, and thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. You want to stop and get out and cast that down from here, or what do you want to do? We can. It looks like a good spot. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, there he is. There you go. A little bit better. That's a good fish. Nice job, man. It's getting ready to get good. <laughs> right here. I just got hammered. Oh, just got hammered again. Got it. Here we go. About 13 inches, 12 inches. It's all about finding this moving water. There he is. Got it. Little guy. You got one up out of the current there. Yep. Nice. Well, I'll tell you what, Spencer, this has been a blast. You can come out here. And you know, bring small soft plastics or small spinner baits. You can even fly fish and catch them. Oh yeah. We're very lucky in Kentucky to have as many creeks and streams that we've got. And if you're thinking about getting into fishing or you're a fisherman and you're just looking for more access to more water, this is the way to do it, isn't it? It's so much fun. Like you said, you gain access to places you can't in a big boat. And it, there's something about being in a kayak out here in nature. You know, and the way that we use these kayaks today, we use the kayaks in a way to get us to the good spots, which was moving water. There he is. Get these jokers back in. All right. Okay. There they go. Yeah. Kentucky and Barkley Lakes are amazing fisheries for panfish, but with some recent declines, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Biologists are studying hard to find out exactly what's going on. 
Today we're at the banks of Kentucky Lake and I'm here with Adam Martin and you're the sport fish biologist here in Western Kentucky for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Tell me a little bit about sport fish biologists. What all species are you looking at? So essentially I manage the sport fish in the western 14 counties of Kentucky, primarily Kentucky and Barkley Lake. So the overall goal is to have healthy fish populations and catchable fish populations so anglers can come down here and enjoy catching fish. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about what you've been studying because you've been specifically looking at nesting and bedding fish, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. So our most popular species on Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley are your black bass, so your largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass, as well as crappie, bluegill, red ear, all of those species will make depression nests whenever they spawn during the springtime. So you've seen them, you know, it's a fish making a bed effectively. Mm -hmm. So that kind of inspired a project, well, what can we do to improve the recruitment of our bass population? And when you say recruitment, what are you talking about recruitment? Essentially the numbers of small fish that are entering the lake. Okay. What you would do in a small pond is you would improve the spawning habitat. Mm -hmm. So you might add in some rocky material if it was mud and, and, and switch things up like that. Well, this obviously isn't a pond, but the same principle should still apply. You just have to do it a lot more. So we've been experimenting with artificial spawning habitat. So we're making artificial spawning beds out of concrete. They're about 32 inches in diameter and they're bowl shaped and we have loose gravel in the bottom of them. They're about 10 to 11 inches tall on the outside. And we're placing those along the shoreline of Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley in the hopes that fish will use them and it's largely been pretty successful so far. When did this program start? It actually started in early 2019 and we've been contemplating it and trying to figure out what to do since about 2018. Okay, so now that the program has gotten going, this is something you will continue for a period of time and there should be some learnings that come from this, right? Sure, we've got about 500 of these artificial spawning beds in the lake so far. Okay. And we've been surveying about 68 of them experimentally by doing snorkel surveys every week for the past two years. Some of these sport fish that you manage spawn at different times. Mm -hmm. So you build this perfect nest up there for a black bass species and the bass come in and they spawn, then what happens? So the bass will start spawning around 57 degrees and they'll continue that activity until about 64 or 65 degrees. After that, you see red ear move in, then you see bluegill, and then finally you see long ear sunfish move in. Okay. They're in there starting very early whenever the red ear is spawning trying to eat eggs. So if you're in an area and you're only catching sunfish, but it's still early, that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're there for a reason. Okay. They're there on the nest of those other fish. And you said they stay to the very end because they spawn last. Exactly, yeah. And while our, our usage rates were about 60% for black bass, largemouth and smallmouth, our usage rates on the nest for sunfish was more like 96%. Wow. Pretty so much every single nest you can count on there being a fish in it. The number of fry that are being introduced in the lake because of the spawning habitat, we're talking hundreds of thousands, right? Oh, uh, easily. A single red ear will produce about 30,000 eggs. Okay. Now, survival rates are very low, less than yeah. 1%. Yeah. That's the same for every fish. Yeah. But, you know, a bluegill has even more eggs. Even a bass, they'll have 12,000. The way that they defend their nests is very different by species and by the individual fish, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that red ear are extremely skittish, like you have to sneak up there cast from 40 feet away and don't splash is kind of the general thought process. That's not what I've seen, you know, snorkeling on them. If you're right there on their nest, they'll stand there and look at you. Hold the ground, huh? A bluegill is much more skittish. Okay. They'll leave, circle back. Along your sunfish, they tend to be pretty aggressive too, so they'll stay right there and defend their nest. Hopefully, we can figure out why certain nests are being used and why some are not and then help that natural habitat so that the bass have more options for spawning as well as bluegill and red ear and all those other species, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, this is great information and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the phone calls and the reports for catches correlate to the success of the spawns. They match this data up in a couple years. You know, this could be cutting edge stuff. Yeah, we hope it helps. Thank you so much. No problem. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have 13-year-old Raina Gardner with her first turkey that was taken in Clark County, Kentucky. She said she only hunted about 30 minutes and got this opportunity and she was super excited. Here we have a picture of Beckham Donnelly. Here he has his very first trout ever. It was caught in Boone Creek. 
Here we have Dennis Ray of Louisville with a nice Oldham County Gobbler. To the left and right is grandson Knox and granddaughter Isla. Here we have Lisa from Alexandria, Kentucky with a nice 20 inch rainbow trout. This fish was caught below Wolf Creek Dam and it's her first Kentucky trout. It might be the middle of summer here in Kentucky, but our fall hunting seasons will be here before you know it. If you need to take your hunter safety course, don't wait till the last minute. Go to fw.ky.gov and sign up online. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.